Chapter 27B's narrated PowerPoint deals with the relocation of Japanese Americans, certainly one of the saddest episodes in uh, modern uh, American history, 20th century American history, and of course having a significant impact on Californians. Um, the attack on Pearl Harbor and false rumors of sabotage and other treasonable acts by Japanese Americans reactivated all the stereotyped racial delusions that had long formed the beliefs of many Californians about the Japanese ever since the late 1800s when Japanese uh, started coming to California in significant numbers. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, unions, clubs, prominent citizens, and elected officials were all complicit in promoting such stereotypes, including Valentine S. McClatchy, who at the time was the publisher of the Sacramento Bee. Um, you know, I don't yet like to use my classes as a bully pulpit, but I will say that it just seems like it's quite shameful that a newspaper would be complicit in doing this. And, you know, they all were at the time. It's just the way it was then. And uh, it was a very, I think, sad chapter in our history. Even California Attorney General Earl Warren had such views in 1939 when he was elected um, as uh, Attorney General of California. Uh, he later became Governor of California and then, of course, became the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And ultimately, he did later on have a change of heart because of a personal experience, uh, which was significant in the 1950s when he was Supreme Court um, when he was the uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, when the uh, case of Brown versus Board of Education came his way. Um, sentiment increased in California after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there was some opposition that was quickly drowned, unfortunately. Uh, notable opposition came from Lieutenant General John DeWitt of the Western Defense Command, who really thought that this was not a good idea and that uh, the gathering of Japanese uh, and assuming they were all enemies, uh, Japanese Americans, was really a bad idea. Uh, he unfortunately later changed his mind after the investigation uh, of Pearl Harbor and reported, and, and, and there was an investigation and report of what happened in Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was released on January 25th, 1942, and pretty much at that time he changed his mind and decided to go with how the majority felt. This report asserted that, quote, Japanese spies on the island of Oahu were involved in Pearl Harbor. Um, this was interpreted by everybody as evidence of widespread Japanese-American disloyalty, and there was just not a shred of evidence to prove this. Uh, this was, of course, discovered after the war, but even during the war, there just, you know, any kind of an argument uh, strongly suggesting that the Japanese-Americans were complicit in Pearl Harbor was really a shaky argument indeed. Uh, two days later, on January 27, 1942, uh, the military guy DeWitt conferred with Governor Culbert Olson of California, who was on record as urging tolerance, um, you know, trying to say, wait a minute, you know, these are Japanese Americans, they are not involved in this, uh, we need tolerance. Uh, DeWitt eventually con uh, uh, convinced Governor Culbert Ocean, uh, Olson otherwise. Uh, the authors of your book assert that DeWitt was more concerned with losing his command, uh, as did those who were in charge of Pearl Harbor uh, when it was attacked. So the two people who were in charge of the c command of Pearl Harbor, because of Pearl Harbor's attack, uh, they lost their command. And it was, DeWitt was afraid that he would lose his position in the Western Command if he did not support the gathering and internment of Japanese Americans. He then prepared a report to the Secretary of War regarding the, quote, evacuation of Japanese and other subversive persons from the Pacific coast, asserting that, quote, over 112,000 potential enemies of Japanese extraction are at large today. So the deal was pretty much sealed. Um, U.S. Attorney uh, General Francis Biddle uh, and the Justice Department prepared arguments against evacuation and relocation. And before they even had an opportunity, before Biddle even had an opportunity to talk to Roosevelt about this, FDR told Biddle that the issue would be decided strictly on military grounds. Uh, FDR then signed Executive Order 9066, which uh, demanded the relocation of Japanese Americans on the West Coast, California, Oregon, and uh, Washington. Uh, the Japanese Americans were required to go to assembly centers uh, first. Uh, in the Fresno area, uh, Pinedale, uh, out now where the Palm Bluffs um, 
uh, business complexes are north of Hernan and Palm there uh, across from all those auto dealers. That was an assembly area over by what where the Calcott uh, cotton warehouses used to be. Basically Camp Pinedale. It was an army camp. And also the Fresno District Fairgrounds. I believe there are memorials in both locations indicating that these were assembly centers. Uh, from the assembly centers uh, they were transported uh, to various camps. In California there were two camps. One was called Manzanar in the Owens Valley and the other one was in Tule Lake near the Oregon border. Uh, these were essentially uh, concentration camps for uh, Japanese Americans and also Japanese who had immigrated here who uh, were not yet naturalized as uh, citizens. Oddly enough, uh, the, the word Manzanar means apple orchard in Spanish and of course by the time they get over to the eastern California desert in the Owens Valley um, at Manzanar there were no apple orchards because by then of course 40 years before, 30 years before, LA had drained all the water from the Owens Lake. Um, the administrators of these camps uh, were the War Relocation Authority, the WRA. Now, they generally permitted as much self-government in the camps as was allowable, but of course there were guards on the perimeters of the camps in towers, but the guns were not pointed out. The guns were pointed in toward the Japanese who were uh, captured and kept in these camps. It was a very sad uh, state of affairs. The camps were essentially prisons surrounded by barbed wire and guarded by soldiers. Relocation had a devastating effect on Japanese American families. You have to understand that the, the people who were there that were children then, if they were say five or six years old in 1942, uh, you have to do the math very quickly here, uh, they would be uh, in their late 70s today and probably Probably some of them, if they're in their late 70s at least and possibly early 80s who are alive that can talk about it, do have vivid memories and images in their mind of, uh, of living as children in these relocation clamps, camps. Even though the threat of invasion by Japan on the West Coast was severely reduced in the Battle of Midway in June of 1942 when the Japanese Navy lost four of their aircraft carriers, movement of Japanese Americans from the assembly centers to the camps took place after that battle, even though there was no existential threat of Japan invading the western United States. <laughs> The mass relocation of Japanese Americans did not make a distinction between those who were American citizens and those who were immigrants awaiting naturalization. It should be noted that very few German and Italian American citizens and aliens were subject to wartime internment and exclusion. Only those who were deemed by danger, to be dangerous by intelligence uh, agencies. Uh, oddly enough, uh, Japanese Americans in Oahu Hawaii were not treated this way because they made up the bulk of the skilled labor on military installations and their continued employment was considered to be uh, a military uh, necessity, which is really quite uh, interesting indeed. So there you have uh, the narration for chapter 27b about the uh, Japanese-American relocation in the early 1940s.